So these are my bees. And if there's one thing I've learned as a beekeeper, it is that the actions of thousands of tiny bees can add up to big changes. There are about 50,000 honeybees in a hive. And um, I try to take care of every single one of them, even down to learning how to put the boxes back together so that I don't squish one. My wife calls me a helicopter bee parent. <laughs> but I can now check on my bees and make sure that they're okay without ever opening the hive simply by using my smartphone. Smartphone innovation is more important than ever for protecting honeybees and the environment. And smartphone environmentalism gives us new opportunities to help the environment and taking a lesson from the honeybees that the actions of many small people can add up to big things. So it used to be uh, that about 15% of hives were lost every year by beekeepers. And mostly this was due to natural causes, things like starvation um, and um, cold. But recently, the number has jumped up to more than 40%. Um, and there's a lot of debate about why this is. Some people blame pesticides. There are diseases like Nosema, which uh, weaken the bees. Uh, or like my bees last year, they can be attacked by a bear. And as you can see, the bear usually wins. <laughs> but the biggest problem actually is the varroa mite, uh, which attaches itself to, be, to a bee and has the appropriate scientific name of varroa destructor. Now, managing for all of these can be very difficult, and it can be hard to keep my bees alive. But it's not all bad news. In fact, the total number of hives in the U.S. is actually increasing. And last year had a 23-year high. So how can this be? How can we be, uh, more hives be dying than ever, and yet the total number is actually going up? And the simple answer is, is that beekeepers have the knowledge and incentives to make sure that their hives survive, whether that is decreasing the mortality or replacing the hives that they lost. If beekeepers don't have hives, they can't make money by pollinating crops like apples and almonds, and they can't sell their honey. And beekeepers closely monitor their hives to make sure that they have the knowledge to make good decisions. You know, uh, they need to treat diseases like Nosema or kill Varroa mites or even buy a bear fence. And the good thing is, is that there's now new tools that allow them to do this more effectively. So Broodminder is a small rectangular uh, sensor that I can put in my hive that connects to my iPhone. Simply by walking up to my hive, I can check the temperature, I can check the humidity, and I can look at the weight. I can see if my bees are adding honey, I can see if they're losing population, um, or I can see um, if it's too cold. And I can do this all without ever opening the hive and disturbing the bees. And I can share the information with the world. In fact, there's a hive over in Victoria that is sharing information um, about how its bees are doing. Even experienced beekeepers can be surprised, and giving them knowledge using smartphones uh, helps them protect their bees. Broodminder is emblematic of a new set of smartphone tools that allows anyone to help the environment, even if you're not a beekeeper. They engage citizen science and use our knowledge and incentives that we have personally to guide us to better ways to help save the planet. Now, putting power in the hands of individuals through smartphones is an important change from traditional environmental approaches and gives us the opportunity to do things we could never do before. And it comes at a very important time when so many of our political solutions are failing to solve our environmental problems. It wasn't always like this. So in 1972, when we created the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, the need for environmental action was obvious. Smokestacks were putting pollution into the air. Pollution was going into rivers and streams. Um, so what we did is we gave power to the EPA to address these problems, and they did a good job. Uh, and our air and water are much cleaner as a result of it. Today, however, environmental problems are very different, and they're more distributed. And what worked in 1972 doesn't necessarily work today. Today, we too often rely on politicians 
uh, to be environmental saviors. And frankly, they're just not very good at it for a variety of reasons. The first is times can change. And people who supported President Obama's efforts on the environment the last eight years are now watching as President Trump undoes many of those same regulations. The second thing is, is that politicians don't have the knowledge and incentives necessary to make good environmental decisions. So about a thousand cities pledged to meet the Kyoto Protocol's carbon reduction targets by 2012. But when the deadline arrived, very few of them actually achieved the goals. Seattle admitted failure, so did Chicago, so did New York, as did about 90% of the cities that signed up. And it's not the only example. Subsidies for corn-based ethanol actually increased environmental damage. Unlike beekeepers or biologists or farmers, Politicians don't have the day-to-day -day experience and knowledge to make good environmental decisions. And frankly, politicians don't like to admit that they were wrong, right? They're worried about the next election. So when the environmental policy doesn't succeed, they tend to hide the failure rather than admit it. And the result is that we waste a lot of money and time and it harms the environment. Well, we can change this. Smartphones and the internet engage our incentives and our knowledge to find good environmental solutions. Engaging those uh, incentives uh, allows us to have everyday knowledge and put it to work for us. And doing that is already helping Steelhead right here in Puget Sound. So this is Fishy McFishface. Fishy was a uh, steelhead who started out life in the Skokomish River and swam about 171 miles up Hood Canal and then back down Hood Canal and then back up Hood Canal. Admittedly, I didn't choose the brightest fish in the world. <laughs> but finally out uh, past the Hood Canal Bridge into Puget Sound and finally to the Strait of Juan de Fuca toward the ocean where Fishy became lunch for some happy bird. <laughs> now, even though Fishy gave its life for science, uh, it didn't die in vain, and it made a difference. Fishy's life helped us understand why steelhead and salmon struggle to make it to the ocean. A group called Long Live the Kings uh, tagged dozens of fish and allowed donors to bid on them, betting on which one would actually make it to the ocean. <laughs> And not only did this raise money and awareness for conservation efforts, it added to that scientific knowledge about the challenges that steelhead and salmon face. So I could check and see that some fish uh, were eaten by seals, others never even made it out of the river where they started. But some fish, like salmonella at the top there, <laughs> actually made it all the way out to the ocean. Every day I could get my smartphone out and see how my fish was doing, connecting my interest in steelhead to real life actions on the ground. A group called Paso Pacifico in Central America, which works with sea turtles, did a similar sort of thing where they tagged sea turtles and allowed donors to watch them as they swam around the ocean. Now, the technologies used, the smartphone technologies used by Broodminder or by Long Live the Kings allow us to connect in an individual way to environmental solutions in a way that simply was never possible before. They give us information and allow us to use it every day, holding us accountable for failure and guiding us to better environmental solutions. And doing that is already helping migratory birds in California. You probably didn't think you were gonna get a speech about the birds and the bees this morning, did you? <laughs> So Cornell University researchers created an app called eBird, and millions of data points have been entered by bird watchers around the world about when and where they saw different bird species. And every dot on this map represents uh, one data point entered by a bird watcher somewhere in the world um, in real time, in one day. So eBird teamed up with um, 
the Nature Conservancy in California to try to find the best habitat for migratory birds. And they took hundreds of thousands of data points and sorted through them to figure out which rice fields would provide the best habitat if they were flooded. About 100 species of shorebirds, ducks, and geese rely on those rice fields. So the Nature Conservancy went to rice farmers and they did a reverse auction. And they said, how much would we have to pay you to create this habitat for these birds? Sort of like Airbnb for birds. <laughs> and it worked. And it was a win-win because the birds got the habitat and the farmers got paid. Without smartphones and without eBird, this would never have been possible. And it also allowed birders to go out and confirm that the habitat that had been created was being used by the birds. Smartphone environmentalism allowed the birds to create the habitat using the, the smartphone uh, environmental uh, technologies. But it also improved our understanding of science and it allowed bird watchers to go out and hold the farmers accountable to make sure that they had actually created the habitat for the birds. Smartphone environmentalism holds the promise of dramatically improving the way we create wildlife habitat. It can help us cut our energy use and cut carbon emissions. And it can even improve the way we use water. And there are already dozens of apps that allow all of us to make these environmental improvements. So for instance, if you want to know how much electricity you're using at any given time, you can simply open up the Sense Electricity Monitor like I have uh, in my home. If you want to cut, uh, if you want to turn down your thermostat and save electricity, you can use Nest. If you want to monitor your water use, you could use Drop Counter. You can figure out if the fish that you're buying are sustainably harvested. You can calculate your carbon footprint. You can even buy solar energy in other states where the sun shines more than it does today. In the same way that Uber and Lyft radically changed the taxi industry, smartphone environmental apps hold the promise of success where politicians have failed. And dozens of these apps and using them multiplies the impact over time to make big differences. The car to go app allows you to find a little two seat smart car somewhere parked near you and rent it by the hour. And you can even unlock it with your phone. This has been so successful that the city of Seattle estimates that there are now 9,000 fewer cars in Seattle as a result of this one app. So for 18 years, I worked in, I've, I've worked in environmental policy. I used to work at the Washington State Department of Natural Resources on issues like uh, spotted owl and old growth forests. And I now sit on the Puget Sound Salmon Recovery Council which makes me a salmon recovery counselor. <laughs> Smartphones bring people together. They create information and they engage our incentives to do better for the environment, to protect the environment for the future, to improve wildlife habitat and create clean air and clean water. They have the ability to multiply all of those efforts so that together we can do more than politicians ever could. Thanks to smartphone environmentalism, the ability to be an environmental hero is literally in the palm of your hand. Thank you so much.